So, uh, hello. I'm uh, talking today about Hackref. It's a device that uses relatively recent technological developments that bring very low cost radio receivers and transmitters with very wide range of spectrum that they can work. So, uh, it looks like this one, but maybe it's better to look like this one. I, I would pass it on between you after the demo. That's, that's three separate devices in the picture. Uh, well, there is a box device oh, right. and <laughs> a TLS DM. Oh. Because there is, of oh, course, even oh. cheaper device that is like $20. What is, what is, oh, the other one is $20, the yeah. small one. So, now actually everybody who, who had the idea, or almost everybody who had the idea that uh, it's nice to listen to high definition TV on the radio and uses the, the sticks for the computers. Most of the people actually have the similar device. So, what they look like. So first, on the top, we see the most popular device. It's RTL SDR. It covers approximately between 50 to uh, megahertz to over 2 gigahertz. Jesus. And it's it's really a stick. I don't have one with me because I brought HackerF. But if anybody wants to compare, it's it's just like this stick. It's the, the same size, except that it's receiver only. And uh, there are different models, and depending on the model, you have different uh, receiving range. Because, of course, it relies on the way you have the, the image or uh, preamplifying and, and uh, antenna. And then uh, people have played a lot with it, have listened to different signals. They found it very useful and very uh, universal device. So, Actually, more and more people are now moving towards uh, universal receiver support. So people often have a single antenna or single set of antennas. That's called MIMO to improve their receiving capability. That does both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth side. Which also has the benefit that if it's on the single chip, then you can automatically resolve the complex. And it has uh, this, the, the range that people try was 30 megahertz to almost 6 gigahertz. So close to 6 gigahertz, the uh, signal becomes very, very noisy for the, the reasons uh, how this electronics is constructed. You can still see some signal if, if it's very strong. And generally, uh, over the whole range, if you have very strong signal, you will see it. Which is uh, very good for any of you who just play with it at home with your own signal. You just wonder why uh, the Wi-Fi reception broke. Especially if you are in 2.4 GHz band, very close to very popular 2.45 band and somebody switched on the microwave and you don't yet know it. So it is basically, if you look at the components, it's bidirectional. So you have antenna, uh, you have uh, in two directions, you have filters, then you can uh, down convert the frequency from the, the desired one to intermediate frequency. And after that, you can uh, sample the signal at 20 mega samples per second. So basically, let's try it with 20 mega, megahertz of the spectrum. So you pick 20 megahertz out of this whole range, and there is a lot of things there. In particular, uh, there are a lot of people that already compared in different devices and because of this SDR technology that we have in both RTL and HackerF, 
the prices are going down. So basically on the right we see USAP, that's a very popular radio amateur and also radio engineer equipment. That's about thousand dollars. So, so that's kind of expensive, but that was still the thing that ten years ago people thought it's so hot because it's so cheap. Yeah. Just to sort of make the point um, a manufacturer of chips that do this, not whole systems. Uh, their flagship product, which covers 300 megahertz to 3.8 megahertz, has just dropped their price to $35 for the chip. Okay. Why microsystems? It's just dropped. LNA? I mean, the. It's which is single in, single It's the LMS 6002. Mm -hmm. single, in, single in, single out. Transceiver, not just receiver. It's a $35 chip now. Wow. Yeah. So you. Yeah, <laughs> this is heading towards why would you make a radio any other way? Yeah, exactly. Especially that uh, if you have you specialized filter, you can have uh, very good filtering, but it's usually very limited in range. So then you have the whole hardware, whole pack of different uh, components that do only one frequency. So, so for preamps and power amps, yes. So we have the first uh, antenna. Actually, uh, the thing that is very popular in this kind of equipment uh, is that first, uh, there is usually a bar, but on this kind of very abstract schema, you don't see it. So first, the antenna is uh, a single wire signal, then you convert it to differential signal to not have losses in the light electronics, because actually the design of this electronics is rather sensitive and high frequencies to the noise. Uh, from its own board. Then you have uh, the down conversion and up conversion depending in which direction you use it. You can use it only in one direction at a time. So then you, of course, at each stage you have switches to make sure that only one channel is active. Then you have uh, the ability to uh, tune your frequency. So the, on the side of this equipment here, you have two slots, and you can connect them to another hacker app to make sure that they are synchronized. And thus, you record instead of 20 uh, megahertz uh, band, 40 megahertz band, and you can scale it a little bit. I hear there are people that connect it for them to get more band. So probably you also want two of them if you want both receiver and the transmitter. And in, in most applications that I will talk about today, you actually are pretty happy with just one, just a receiver. And then you sample it by LPC4320 uh, or similar microcontroller that has the ability to sample 20 mega samples per second in ADC. So this equipment works at uh, actually 8 bit, but there is also an option to do it at 12 bit. And what is important is this, that it samples differential signal. So one signal is the reference for the other. Since they run in parallel, then basically it makes sure that the induction effects are compensated. And the next, of course, what do we want to do with it? So what, what do we have, the, what kind of problems we have with the RF device most of the time? Mm, probably it breaks connection at random paths, and we don't know why. Sometimes there, there, there is actually a story, like if you go by this special building, there is something because nobody hears it. You cannot even talk by the phone. I once worked in a building that uh, was so well screened that you didn't have any working cell phone inside, unless next to the window. And the theories were plentiful until somebody actually checked. And it turns out that it was uh, winter isolation, which is popular in Europe, especially in Germany, because people want to save energy. And actually, when they put the isolation, they saved a lot of uh, heating, 
but they also made it impossible to waste your work, precious working time with a cell phone. So I, I, I'm not sure if it was intended. It's very efficient. Especially since it was actually the building where uh, they had very uh, electromagnetically savvy, I would say, people, because the most of their equipment were uh, high uh, magnets, like quite a few Tesla ones, uh, and uh, magnetic resonance equipment. So it was already shielded in the places where it matters. <laughs> and they added this isolation in that it was triple shielded, probably. So, uh, next thing, uh, when Bluetooth came, initially there were a lot of problems uh, with interference between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Now we have Wi-Fi N, and the latest Bluetooth that actually know that there is supposed to be interference, and try to avoid that. But uh, the users of the ISM bands on which Wi-Fi and Bluetooth work actually are plentiful, and not all of them actually consider so, for example, the, the most frequent application is uh, remote control. That, that you can see, smart home. Most of these applications just ignore this thing. Or we just change the band if it doesn't work for us, without taking a consideration that maybe we just jump the signal to somebody. So that's also very popular. Uh, Especially in the buildings, we have the problem with multipath interference. So we have uh, quite a few places here that maybe there is uh, some kind of metal. Uh, and multipath interference means that any signal that will be generated here may be delivered to a place 100 meters or 50 meters from here at, say, 100 microseconds, 200 microseconds. So that looks like two different signals, yeah? And then you have very high precision equipment that receives it, that samples it, and that tries to figure out what was the signal. And of course, we need to compensate for that. And it's good to at least see it. So basically, you can invoke, uh, you can transmit a signal by just switching on your device, usually. And you see it uh, in the spectrum that there is kind of equal. And yeah, these are the most popular problems. I'm sure there are many more. What's the PI to Ah, uh, this is the story about this building. So it's very, very one, one of the better stories. I hear that uh, the, the story was actually so welcome that uh, the cinema planned to, 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 do, to, to do the same because then nobody would have this uh, bell in the middle. No, nobody would ring in the middle of the sound, so... So, some of the problems we can debug by ourselves by just changing operating system and comparing it. But it's not very, like, it's rather frustrating. So, you tell the story about your computer that doesn't work with Wi-Fi, and then you hear the story of this, this machine works with Wi-Fi. Usually, before you debug the problem, it's a few months, a few stories and quite a few diff different devices that are around. Of course, you can just have a lot of antennas. So, unfortunately, I changed my computer. But before I changed it, like one year ago, I, I'm still jealous of the owners of ThinkPads. Because usually they have very well-placed antenna behind the screen. And as far as I remember, actually, I usually have had a problem. I received so many Wi-Fi. I actually usually had like hundreds of stations. It is registered every three, three, thir, 300 milliseconds. I knew about them, the delay was too much. So the, the beacons were rarely visible because of interference. But I was aware that they exist. And usually the problem I have with this computer is that I see 10 of stations, and sometimes I don't see the iPad, which is next to me. So it really depends on the antenna. Yeah. And of course, if I didn't have the hint that this iPad must be transmitting, I would believe that I don't have a Wi-Fi network. So uh, the newer devices start to tell you what is the signal strength. But it's still 
very, very naive measurement. Because first you need to receive, then you need to recognize that it's Wi-Fi signal on this band. Uh, usually that's, that's quite well done. But if you have high enough noise, then you will not see it. Especially that newer communication technologies, as I will show in a minute, <laughs> actually they look like just higher noise in the given band. So because of OFDM, orthogonal frequency, the modulation, they basically try to cover the band very efficiently. And they do it by just throwing it. So they are not giving a nice spectrum. Yeah. So the uh, frequent problems that uh, people have heard about before they started looking for the spectrum. So no, not everybody has nice uh, hacker. Right? And people s suspected that maybe 5 gigahertz band is less used because there are less devices that they hear about. Yeah, but it's nothing sure until you measure. Uh, the ISM bands were suspected to be pretty crowded. But uh, until you measure, you don't know where exactly because uh, a lot of uh, these uh, devices that uh, actually transmit, may transmit uh, even though the transmission is unused. So they just signal in case somebody, for example, uh, that's very, very common in utilities, to leave some kind of transmitter or RFID that will just, actually, it will flash back the incoming signal. But it increases noise too if you are close to this frequency. Because whatever you will uh, transmit on this frequency will we'll come back to you as a different signal. So you don't know. But also, we've got devices like notebooks and phones which could be simply turned on. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's and really of course, off. all computers are pretty well screened, but they usually have this frequency that they generate by themselves, not one, that can uh, bring it in a lot of noise. If the screening fails, then until you actually measure it, you don't know. I actually heard about a laptop of one company that just had the, the misfeature that some of the copies of the laptop spontaneously uh, transmitted FM signal with your voice or whatever was around the laptop. <laughs> hmm. Feature. Yeah. I guess, I guess what, what would happen, in, like normally people just radial matters search for other transmission. Right? It was not very frequently used that because it was very, very long. But still, yeah, maybe somebody would try to talk to them. And of course, uh, there is sometimes the shift in the frequency. So if your crystal is a bit off, then basically you are uh, transmitting in slightly different frequency and uh, if the, the receiver doesn't compensate for it. And the, the transmission is perfectly strong and valid and it takes the big chunk of the spectrum and it's completely useless in the receiver. And as a disclaimer, before we go to the demo, sure. uh, I, I, what I know is certainly if you use HackRF for receiving, <coughs> you may be legal, but if you use it for transmitting, then you certainly have to have a license. Yeah. That is general. The second, uh, if you transmit, you need to obey the transmitter limits. So this device by itself will not uh, yield to strong transmission, but naturally radio matters usually connected to amplifiers. Then you better know you have the license for the, the exact frequency and the exact strength of the signal and you don't don't connect 100 watt amplifier <laughs> unless you are really having a broadcast license and you really know what to do just in case some you surprise some other equipment around hopefully just equipment and uh, for license fees usually you pay or you pass the exam depending on the kind of license fee. And uh, some communications uh, require special permission 
to listen to. So possibly not the white right? Yeah. And uh, as an introduction to Wi-Fi spectrum, Wi-Fi spectrum is divided into many channels. And most of them are overlapping, so depending on your problems with the particular part of the spectrum and propagation, you can shift the channel slightly. But you also have uh, four non-overlapping channels, so you can have four stations that do not conflict at all. And the, well, while the signal looks like it's concentrated in the middle, it, it takes the, the whole part of the spectrum. And of course, uh, when you use the multi uh, banding, or how do you call it, the, the wide, wide bands, basically. The, the latest uh, Wi Fi standards have the option to give you twice or four times the, the, the speed at the cost of the bandwidth. So you have to have a device that has more capability. Then you take more spectrum. Uh, the exact channels for 2.4 GHz line like this, so they are pretty overlapped. So I will, I will actually use 5 GHz because I just connected myself to the network so I can listen to my own signal. And to follow the demo, to try it at home if you have error, you need to upgrade install new radio and hardware. So uh, if you don't have a Linux machine, that's equally simple. You just download new radio and then you look at the HackerF webpage and download the software for HackerF. You just need the drive. Yeah. Quick, quick uh, aside here. Uh, don't do it here because new radio is massive and it takes a long time to download. Do it when you have decent bandwidth. Yeah. So don't don't download the source code. I, I think actually uh, it can be like ten minutes to download or something. I've taken longer. Uh, on, on OS X, if you're using backports, uh -huh. uh, it downloads source and compiles it. And oh, no, 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 no. Only source and compiling takes more like three, Even four hours. Say, yeah, because it has a lot of dependencies. Yes. So I, I install it normally from binary packages, from distribution, then it's really a few minutes. Depends really on your network. If with LD, it can be much, much less. So we have 10 minutes, two minutes, for example. But if you bring in all the dependencies yep. and compile it from scratch, it has very unusual dependencies, yep. like liborg, yep. and they are huge. Yep. So the, it has its own compiler for very simple programs that run on simple processors. So since it, it needs a lot of Python and compilers, uh, yes. Okay, so now what I will try to do hopefully succeed is to move so first we will start with the so depending what you want if you feel like I can start from scratch and show you how to work it with new radio and hacker or I can just demonstrate how it works so that when it's set up do the demo yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. show the working mode so, I just need to. Ah, yes. Make sure that I mimic the display because otherwise it would be awkward because I wouldn't be looking at you when I'm showing you what's happening. So, GNU Radio is very simple graphical programming that produces Python code. So, if I decrease the canvas in which I have drawn the schema of what we are doing, you will see different components. So, first we have different GUI boxes that configure different variables. So these are transmitted to HackerF to set up it for receiving. So this is, I just add the component from the 
many on the right, like Osmocom. Yeah. And I can add it either as transmitter or receiver. With what I said previously, that for transmitter you probably need a license. So I take the source, I set up the sample rate, the frequency, and I can also set up the gain. Here I uh, leave them at default values and I use AGC component, which is automatic gain correction. So in GNU Radio, every component has outputs and inputs that you just connect easily. So blue are complex inputs and outputs, which are most suited for any serious radio. So if you have real signal, so it looks like you would expect it that it is just one wave and not two waves that are in phase between each other, then it's complex to analyze it. Now, after automatic gain correction, I put just two things. First is water pulse sync, and the second is FFT signals. Both are graphical visualizations of the spectrum. And if I run it now, then I can see that here it probably needs auto scaling. Yeah. There is some artifact in the middle of the spectrum, but otherwise it's pretty much empty. Okay, so let's try to download something. Yeah. Or if it doesn't work, I will just make sure that I do. Yeah. Did I click it wrong, wrong way? Something is already done, right? Downloading? The middle one? Okay, so it's downloaded. So if I do pick hole, there you go. Something appears, yeah? Yeah. Even though here I didn't, oh, there, there, there is actually signal. I didn't do any gain correction. So before you get proper signal that you can analyze, you need to tune up uh, the, the gain, of course. Because here it's just automatic gain correction. And since I'm covering almost only the band of Wi Fi, it's showing something only when there, there is transmission from my computer. So I don't hear anything else. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not. Oh, I, I think it doesn't really progress with this download. Oh, it doesn't. Maybe. Maybe that, then we will see it again. Oh yes. Now, 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 now we. Have. So as you see, it sh basically shares the spectrum. So I put the hold here. So whenever there is a signal, it will show something. But most of the time. Uh, it probably sees the beacons from the other computers and it doesn't uh, transmit anything. At this gain level, it will not just see that there is a signal. It's too You're working with a 20 megahertz wide yeah. slice. Yeah, so it should, it should cover the whole channel here. So here it's actually the. This is 20. So uh, I'm not exactly oh, with the device. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, answer. So this is at 5.2 gigahertz. 5.28 gigahertz. Yeah. So I, I basically, what I did, I started downloading something, and then I checked uh, what is my band, and, and I tuned exactly to the same band. If you have a better setup, so you need to tune the gain. You need to make sure that your antenna is kind of good. I'm not sure about this antenna. It's, I'm not sure it's that good. So I just connected random random piece of copper, basically. And then you tune to the frequency. Yeah. yeah it's, it's actually way too long for this. Um, no, it's... Wrong, wrong spectrum. Though. Nine centimeters. You need to be about two and a half centimeters long. It's yeah, it, it should look like actually this uh, slightly round spectrum. Five point two. You can't uh, hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But 
not you just waterfall for what's for whether or not they are, it's not obvious when there's a signal, despite the fact that there's a bad effect it is will change. Is that we missing something? It's still burning. That's like stopped. Yeah, exactly. Uh, unfortunately, then I need to restart. So again, it doesn't seem to do much. Actually, it's hard to see, but the, the blue peak is at minus five dBs. It's actually quite. It's so they, 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 this is an unfortunate central artifact of our current. So okay. generally, at whichever frequency you will tune it. So I can tune it at exactly 5 gigahertz, and you will see the same problem. You mean zoom in vertically or horizontally? Horizontally. No problem. So basically, we can decrease the band to say 2 megahertz. But then probably it would be yeah. It would stop it because it cannot do it on the run. And you, you still see this unfortunate artifact. The RTL SDR that I used before doesn't have this problem. So generally, uh, what I observed already is that HackRF, especially at very high frequencies, it can it can do that, but it has very high noise and it's generally difficult to tune. So actually, sometimes I use RTL SDR because it has uh, given me a nice spectrum, and then I use HackRF on this specific part. But of course, in the band that you have only HackRF capability, you don't have any Maybe I should just exchange my uh, antenna. So the antenna is optimal for about 600 megahertz. So you're. No. It's not, it's not quite the right size for you. It's not quite the right size. I assume it's good right. Then it's, it's. That's about what it's using. We can check at the other bands. So if I, I think uh, iPad generally uh, transmits at. Uh, if you look at two point four, yeah, I'm sure you can find like hundreds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then <laughs> it's got a Bluetooth low energy device that you can definitely track. Sure. Uh, I don't need that. So yeah. Okay, maybe I didn't want that much. So basically, it, normally the interface just shoots frequency. Maybe I will just use this. Can I just start at the bottom of the yeah, I, I, I see the band and what you have? Yeah, so the, all the C cells that we observe for a point to are these frequencies, 2.412, yeah. Maybe I should switch to this frequency, if I can. That would be AP1 crypto. Okay, that's probably encrypted, so I cannot speak to that. But if I... Why don't you put the, the switch yeah. next to it? I've got the BME device on it. Yeah? Let's okay. put it next to it. Which frequency? 2.40. Um, 
for one time. It's good, it, 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 it channel hops around. Yeah. Via the channel hops around. Yeah. Okay. So, do you remember the advertisement channel? Is which, uh, so, there which is obviously channel. something here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see something there? Yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. I think it's heavy. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, that's the nice bar. So obviously, if you don't send the packets, there is nothing here. So yeah. it doesn't detect. But, but uh, for stuff like Bluetooth Bear, it will keep sending uh, like heartbeats. So you, you add a different packets, right? Yeah, may maybe I should have a better hold because the, this hold basically, I think it reports it too early. Because Brutus normally gives these packets every few hundred minutes. 14 minutes, 14 minutes. You can say. Yeah. 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 Ah, but because I changed the frequency, oh, so okay. actually the, when we sing it, I think it must be a word. Yeah. <coughs> so what you can do is maybe change also. the... Maybe I will ju just disable okay. the other widget and just use the word. Sound like trying to get it wide. There you go. Ooh. Now I just might better. I guess that's a typical case that if you don't sample enough spectrum, you cannot kind of discharge it. It's like a very small. Yes. Guys, can we do Q and A after? So, because we will go through the speakers, we can take breaks. Oh, okay. Question after off mic. Thank you, Mika. Oh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben. Uh, it's my first time here. I'm so nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. So before I begin, uh, just let me uh, have a caveat that I am not a hacker. I've not done any hardware, you know, stuff. But I, I, I'm actually uh, more comfortable with web development uh, and web app. So with that as a starting point, uh, a bit about myself, how it looks is that um, I teach web programming in schools, uh, and uh, as part of this IDA Smart Nation uh, project, I'm a private contractor with uh, IDA. And I'm currently teaching about uh, 10 to 15 schools uh, from primary school to secondary as a JC in uh, coding. So really, you want to get the kids uh, to be exposed to coding uh, and hopefully get this movement pushing it forward uh, more than just about web apps, but as well as in other areas. Right? So this is what I'm doing uh, full-time at the moment. Um, and I, and uh, why I came across this, uh, this product was very, it's by chance, because I was thinking, okay, you know, the kids are learning programming and stuff, and some schools, you know, I'm, I'm a businessman as well, I need to get the schools to sign up for the course, so the IDA will pay me. So I do go to the schools to pitch for, uh, for them to take our courses. So the good thing about the program is that the schools don't pay me. As long as they sign up and IDA approve, IDA will pay the company. So that's a sweet deal for the school. So the schools now have to choose, you know, why, why do I want my kids to learn uh, web application development? What if they want to do robotics? What if they want to do mobile apps? Uh, okay, fine. Uh, I only have you know uh, a bag of tools, but if I can teach everything, all right, uh, with just one set of skills, I think it would be fantastic. 
So um, looking at that, I came across uh, a Google and search. What if I can, is there a private controller that I can use to teach students programming using JavaScript, you know? So if they were to learn very basic um, web development in the beginning, they learn a bit of HTML, they exposed to a bit of uh, JavaScript, and from there, they have a, they built a base, and now they can learn uh, to use the same skill set to learn hardware programming. I think it's fantastic. Then they can go and explore and be creative. And I came across this product called Tassel, and surprisingly, it was only recently crowdfunded successfully last year or year before. And uh, I just went ahead to order a set and to play around with it. And I was really, really surprised that it was so easy. Uh, and before I know it, I wanted to order another set, but they said that, oh, sorry, version two is coming out. You know, so save your money. Right. So right now, this is uh, the Tassel, the Tassel board. Uh, pretty small thing. I bought the, I bought the, I'm not a salesman. Huh? I'm just sharing. Huh? Um, Price-wise, I thought it was a little bit high, but if you look at the, the time I, I saved on learning, uh, it's, worth, it's worth it. Uh. So the starter kit for this is comes with four modules. Um, this is a baseboard as per like an Arduino. Uh, it comes with 32 meg of RAM, a Wi-Fi chip built in, uh, four of these ports, I don't know what to call it, and some GPIO stuff. I'm sure you guys are more familiar with it than me. And four modules. Uh, I think you have a uh, ambient, with a camera. You also have uh, an accelerometer. Oh, five. I'm sorry. Uh, to control the servo, you've got a uh, accelerometer. You've got the servo controller, and you've got a climate controller. So sweet deal. You've got five of these, and it's for US hundred and seventy. For the whole set, um, the base board, if I'm not wrong, they are now like this Tassel 2. They have changed the design a little bit. Instead of four of these ports, they only have two, but they give you two other USB uh, ports instead. So it's uh, much more uh, cheaper. It's only thirty five dollars now instead of hundred and something. I don't know how much it costs. But only available in August. So let me just show you and demonstrate, uh, and I will welcome you guys to come and play around with it uh, later on because. You guys will do a better job than me. <laughs> okay, so all you have to do um, is to run. Let me show you the code first. Uh, for those of you who are uh, a bit more savvy, the very basic one that would do is like a hello world of hardware would be the blinky code just to blink a few LEDs. It's as simple as this. Okay, in JavaScript, it's just calling require a Tesla module, and then the LEDs are in an arrays, right? Uh, zero and one output, and, and that's it. Okay, and run it. All right, and to run it is as simple as using the terminal. We're just gonna run this. Um, I go to the Blinky script. It's Tesla run Blinky JS. Okay, that's it. I'm just gonna run it, and you can see Blink. All right, it's compiling. Does it work? All right. That's it. It's blinking and it's logging now. Quite right, simple as that. <laughs> Two LEDs, yeah, and you can set the interval. I mean, it's very simple and basic, right? So, nothing more rocket science. It's just okay. Uh, console log the message Y can blink, control C to start, okay, and LED toggle on and off at 100 uh, millisecond interval. So you can set 500 or whatever. Uh, so, that's on port A. Uh, sorry, this is only on the board. Now, I'm going to demonstrate the, the other one, which is the uh, ambient. Now, ambient chip is able to detect uh, the levels of noise and light right and it is i'll show you the code all right very simple uh, it's understandable uh, at least to me it, it uses the ambient uh lit requires this thing which you just have to do an ambient install as simple as that and then uh, when it's ready you'll get light interval and then you will just lock light interval the the the, the data that comes back to you the promise light trigger as well and then the sound, same thing, all right? So I'll just run it again, all right? That would be uh, ambient, okay? So what it loads a little bit, I think just a bit of background technical stuff like this. I'm reading it as a third party, so I'm not too sure how it works. So I think they use a Lua, Lua code to do it, and then they just wrap JavaScript around it. So that, that's how it works, apparently. Okay, so now it is logging the sounds. Never to shout, okay, guy. If something happens with sound, the level goes up and it locks again. Right. So basically, it, it's not too bad. Yeah. Shine light and stuff, okay? And pretty one-on-one stuff, huh? 
And the last one, I'll, I'll just uh, demonstrate, would be, um, okay, so basically it just uses port A, right? So now I'm going to call up the uh, camera script which, to use port B. I plug uh, it in port A, the embed, now port B will be the camera. And I'll try to take a picture of you guys with this, okay? The quality is pretty sucky, but I think as a learning tool is good enough for the price. So all you have to do for the camera is that once you run the script, it will take a picture. Camera take picture very much like what you use for your mobile app, kind of a Cordova and stuff, a picture. Right, so uh, I'm going to run the script again. And this calls for Tessel run the JavaScript camera JS and where to save the files to our directory. So everybody, and I like Blink's smile, <laughs> right? Okay, it's done, it's taken. Okay. So let's see. It's somewhere here. This guy. Yeah. Oh, this one does not is this the one? No, this one. Okay, it was just now. Okay. Yeah, so it's taken somewhere there. All right? Oh there you go. Just now. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Ah, forgot the open. Why? Oh, well, it happens. Me in China. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, any questions for me? Uh, I can't answer much, but I'll try as much as I can. It says on the page before you said that it says no JS and JavaScript. Oh, okay. Oh, right, right. Right. Um, further right. Up, further up. Up, up the page. Top. The top. Yeah. So the Go for slash Yeah. Okay. Um. So to install this this fella, right? Um. You can go to documents. Um. It was all JavaScript code. So technically code, right? You're yeah. doing require blah require blah. It's so so Node is running on the. No, it's not. So you can write code in Node or JavaScript. Yes. Yeah. Could, yeah. And then it compiles it to Lua. And then it runs Lua JIT on the board, on, on the microcontroller itself, which then takes a Lua code and runs it. Right. So, so it's not it's like the node. It's, well, it's kind of like running JavaScript on the microcontroller, although it's not really. Because you can't really run V8 in 32 bit right? Right. Yeah. Sounds French to me, but it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> V8 is like ridiculously. Uh, okay. Yeah, so all the most I'll install using a uh, node. Node.js, I do an npm install and you can just install it straight away, all the modules, and just run it so as simple as that. Yeah. So, install it like this. Uh, my question is, is this Tesla tool created for the sole purpose of education or is it meant to? Apparently it's not. Um, I mean, for me, I use it for education, but apparently if you were to look at what they are doing in the business plan, uh, is that, you know, after they sell you all the stuff, right, they are able to um, provide a service for prototyping to scale up to production. So they would, um, I don't know, there's some price, price things here, right? they can manufacture prototyping as well. So I guess it is also part of the uh, prototyping uh, industry and stuff. Any idea if there are any like, existing like, uh, actual production uh, products that um, there, there are there are some videos, not many, uh, on on YouTube as well. Um, I, I saw one that they used this to build uh, uh, with Angular Jet, a uh, uh, flying drone. So I don't know. Yeah. So this. Um, I can't answer that question, I wouldn't know, but I think, um, hey, you can hack it. <laughs> sure. So I really can't answer that question, yeah. Right. Is there a Wi-Fi? Oh, yes, there is a Wi-Fi. It's, it's built on the baseboard. Oh, it's built on the Yeah, it's built on the baseboard. Yeah, so it comes with Wi-Fi. Uh, this is, I think, only uh, AMD, but the version 2 will have uh, N as well. Yeah, so, so, so you can run, like, standard exit, like, uh, request or whatever. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, let me. I, I think I did one experiment the other day. Was it client JS? Yeah, it was client JS. Right? 
Um, you're able to, to run a, a client on this and you can like, chat with the board on this as well. Can you show the code? Okay. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, wow, WebSockets. Yeah, WebSockets, yeah. So you could, uh, I can do a demo later on you know, in the small circle, you can actually sure. uh, talk to it and stuff. So I want to just run it now. Let's see what it does. Huh? Oh, I can't. I need to connect to the Wi-Fi first, so I'll be later on. Yeah. Alright. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is my first, actually this is our first hardware session where we come and talk about uh, the technical details of things. And I don't know how this how these sessions worked, so I didn't prepare anything. Actually, I actually thought I was going to go through the app we created during the competition itself. So I'll do that first. We'll just go through what we created, and then uh, if you guys have any questions about how this works, uh, I'll cover those aspects. So my my team is just setting up our system. Okay, so I'll tell you where the motivation came for uh, this project. So we realized that a lot of us are busy in our daily lives and uh, we might have somebody we take care of, their medical health maybe, maybe your parents or your, your children, you're, you're tending to their medical health. So if somebody is having medication on a regular basis and you're busy, there's a possibility that you might forget to get their medications on time. So uh, we developed this, this smart medical jar which is at the end of the user who's the patient or the person who's being taken care of and uh, he loads his pills onto the jar. Now when the number of pills falls below a certain threshold, the caretaker, the person who is busy and taking care of this person gets a notification that the pills have fallen below a certain level. So then he can, uh, he can go on to purchase medicines on the application itself and that's, that's basically what our whole setup was about. So uh, I'll show you what we, oh sorry, <laughs> I'm covering everything up. So I'll show you what we developed in uh, the hackathon in 24 hours and then after that I'll get into how the back end works, what's, what's happening at the back end. So, okay, so this is the application which will be at the end. Okay, let me just stand over here. So, this is the application which is at the end of the caretaker. So, you have an account with uh, our company or uh, whatever it's called. The name, the name of this app is Java. So, you have an account with this app and you can log in. And then you can see the profile of different people you're taking care of. So if you have a dad you're looking after, you can see what are the different jars he uh, is holding. These are different medicine jars. And you can look at your mom as well. She has a couple of jars under her name as well. So you have a couple of jars configured to each of the, each person you're taking care of. And uh, yeah, so let's let's zoom into your dad. So say your dad uh, takes a bunch of medicines. So during the competition, I had to pick up uh, a bunch of medicines. <laughs> uh, uh, which I could put down for this for this uh, for this interface, and I didn't realize what I did, but I think I've picked up medicines for diabetes, breast cancer, <laughs> prostate cancer. So it's it's all mixed up. But this is just a demo. So let's say uh, this this medicine is for diabetes, and say your dad is uh, is consuming his diabetes tablets, and say he has a bunch of tablets at one go. So I'm taking out some tablets from the jar, and uh, what the app will pick out now is that. Your, your tablets have fallen below a certain threshold. So yeah, so it gets communicated all across and you know that it's fallen below a certain threshold. Now you can you can zoom into this jar and look at what details you need to look at about the medicine. So you can see what it's actually doing. It's treating diabetes, uh, do not use it here for problems. And then you can go on to actually purchase uh, the medicine through the Brain Tree app. So that's what uh, we're doing now. Now we had another feature which we added to this application. So we realized that when you're when you're caring for uh, when you're caring for somebody uh, suffering from a particular cause, say your dad is suffering from diabetes, and you're buying your medicines all the time for diabetes, or he's suffering from cancer or some other ailment, you're more likely to sympathize with other people suffering from the same cause. So we installed a feature here which lets lets you donate to that cause which. Uh, your loved one is suffering from. So the app is smart enough to associate the medicine with uh, the ailment and, and give you a, a, a notification to make contribution to that uh, to that cause. Now, 
once you identify the cause, the next thing we got to do is to link you up with a couple of charities which uh, work with that cause. So we use a just giving uh, application to identify charities which are uh, associated with that ailment and give you a list of charities which you can donate to. So that's the whole uh, product which we came up with uh, during the hackathon. Yeah, and I guess people liked it and they they give us <laughs> the axe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, but well, you guys didn't bring the axe. So we don't bring the, the axe. Point because you <laughs> show us the axe. <laughs> so yeah. that's what the application was about. So there are there are things at the back end with respect to hardware as well as software which we can talk about. But since this is a, it's it's more about the hardware over here. So I'll talk about the hardware. And these guys are really the experts at the software. So I'll, if you have any questions about the software at the back end, they, they can talk about it. I keep blocking this. So what I used for the hardware was. Uh, an Arduino and I have a weight sensor out here so I've wrapped it up neatly so that you can't see uh, the load cell below this but there's a load cell below this and I connect it up to the Arduino and uh, signals are sent through Bluetooth to a controller over here and the controller actually is connected to the internet and it uh, it goes through uh, it sends the messages of uh, yep, through, through to the server so that's how on a very broad level how things work in this system. So the basic idea here was that let's say you are in a house and your dad is probably taking four or five medicines, he will definitely have four or five jars. So all those jars will be connected to this one controller. And also what we realized during the course of development was that uh, let's say I put my hand inside here and then take the medicine out. So the weight fluctuates a lot, initially it will be quite a lot and then it will drop and stabilize. So that kind of a logic, these uh, to basically send the stabilized weight to the server, all this kind of logic went inside the controller. So uh, the idea is that this controller will probably sit in one house and all the jars will be connected to it and all the jars will be profiled for each user and medicine and through the phone we will take this data and monitor uh, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so each medicine, at least uh, I think the branded medicines, not the generic ones, have a fixed weight associated with it. So, uh, at the back end, we created uh, a, database. Uh, a fake database of each medicine with the weight associated and uh, the, the ailment associated with, as well with the medicine. So that was the database we used to identify what what uh, cause you could donate to. And it also helped us identify how many tablets were left in the jar itself. So if we have the weight of the jar, we know the, the weight per tablet, and we can compute the number of uh, tablets left inside the jar. That's a back-end database. And we think, uh, like, we came up with a fake database, but uh, it's it's possible to create this if you really have to. And there are services out there that allow you to pull this down. Yeah. So basically when we designed the patient model, we wanted to basically have some sort of prescription yeah. attached with the patient. So using the prescription, you can basically calculate uh, which brand of medicine that guy is using. So our initial idea was to basically uh, just get the jar automatically configured. But since it was a hackathon, we just basically put it one jar. But ideally what you could have is you could purchase these jars and you could basically feed in some sort of a prescription. Uh, during the onboarding stage. And then we use this prescription at the back end to basically calculate what is the weight of the each pill. And once we get a stabilized weight, uh, we calculate what is the number of pills that are remaining. And if it uh, drops below a certain threshold, we, we sort of uh, know that you know this is uh, getting over. Now, the threshold can be changed. So that is something uh, the back end allows. One of the improvement is that you use and the buzzer to the jar itself because then it also programs the schedule of how much yeah. 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 the yeah. yeah. That can make this model, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is uh, the other thing is we chose Bluetooth over other protocols uh, because Bluetooth is quite cheap. Uh, the the module is quite cheap. And you can shrink the en entire Arduino board size into a small ship. So you can actually fit this inside a proper jar, and then the jar becomes a product itself. So, yeah. And the jar obviously knows what it's built in, if it's built in. You can configure it. So yes. that was the onboarding actually, step. Actually, the jar doesn't. The jar doesn't. Work. You configure it. Uh, so, so this is just a very dumb. So actually, we are, we are all like software guys. So we kept the, the hardware part very basic. So the jar uh, just has an ID. Which is, which, which is sent to the server. 
and the jar by the jar ID we are able to determine uh, which medicine and what project. So the onboarding process where you add a jar is where you where you, you it's like when you set up your clock, uh, watch like smartwatch or something you would see new jar found you click on it and you say okay this is this jar is for I don't okay. know some medicine A and that's that's how it's done. So the jar is actually independent of what it contains. You could probably use it to store the kitchen ingredients. <laughs> Make sure that you use uh, Bluetooth and then you also mention the jar connection to the server. Can I understand the exact mechanism? Are you connecting the phone as a proxy? Yeah, so so this we have one device which acts as a controller. So by controller we mean that every jar which has a Bluetooth can connect to this and in a round robin fashion they each send their jar, uh, jar weight to the controller. The controller is connected to the internet and that's where everything happens. For this case the controller is a phone but we can actually use like Anything. something like the Amazon Dash, we can something like that, a small device, we put it somewhere in the house, it just has an internet connection and a Bluetooth connection, the only two things we need. I have a last question about hardware, do you have any pictures of the hacks? <laughs> <laughs> are, if you can connect with the internet, you, you, you can find a bunch of rituals. Yeah. Yeah. This is the hardware. <laughs> That's the real hardware. <laughs> I think there are some photos. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a few. Yeah, that, everybody gets each one. person gets one hand. Yeah, each person gets one hand. And I'm the only one holding it with one hand, so I'm the strongest. I, I, I look pretty. <laughs> But you know, sleep deprived, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, good job. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, and I think uh, last talk it's um, Kai. Right. Should we go with that? Yeah. Hey guys. Uh, the demo is over here, so I don't have to connect the way we're on here. Okay. Ready. Okay. Who has a Raspberry Pi here, by the way? Like, almost everyone. Awesome. Hey, hey, Rick. Rick, are you coming for this? It's going to be awesome. He's doing a magic show. Yes, he will. Okay, so how many of you actually attach some hardware to your Raspberry Pi? Do the three, four, five, six. Okay, well, I mean, I've attached, the, uh, I have this Raspberry Pi at home. It plays back the movies I download from the internet. Legally. Legally. Very legally. <laughs> and I use it to, um, I use it so that when I walk by my screen, I just walk in front of it and the screen just lights up. And I also use it to power some lights above the screen. And we, um, we actually made it. I made a stupid like video with a friend of how it all works. Stefan, Stefan came around and we were just messing around with it. Stefan from paper. He works with paper. Yeah. Um, and I think not, not not many people know it's it's quite simple to do something with hardware. That's my relay. I need some more. I want to control everything in my house really with through my Raspberry Pi. What? So I'm not using any crazy tool chains, I'm just using the all-powerful shell language using a GPIO binary from the wiring pie lab, uh, package or something like that. So without looking at the video, I mean I can this is boring now. It's boring. What's the old powerful shell language? I have no idea. It's it's bash shell. So, uh, right when you when you're running uh, on a shell, you just run something like watch GPIO read all, and you see all the the, the pins of your of the what do you call that that GPIO pin out, and the PIR sensor is actually attached to GPIO seven. So if you look at that zero value, and I just go over here. Whoa. Whoa. And yeah, I mean, that's just a start. You can obviously build on that, add relays, and go nuts with it, uh, which, which uh, you might want to do. Well, one complaint about the Raspberry Pi is that, um, unlike, say, an Arduino, which is a lot simpler, you just like, run a, a program in a loop, the Raspberry Pi, you have to run, run a whole operating system, and you have to maintain it, 
And that is a real pain in the ass. Oh no, not anymore. Um, I don't know if you know what I do for a living, but I, I maintain an operating system called Web Converger. And I have now a uh, soft, uh, soft launched uh, Raspberry Pi version of, of Web Converger. And what does Web Converger do? It just loads up um, a web page. It's free. It's free, it's open source. But if you have a lot of them, I hopefully you'll pay for that. <laughs> but for, for you guys um, who, who just hobbyists, just have one at home, it's, it's, it's very free. And it's all open source. And the cool thing about it is that it auto updates. So you don't have to go there and do your Pac Man or your App Get upgrade. It just auto updates. And you can add like little files, like, for example, this is how basically my, my screen turn on the, uh, service works. I have a, who, who's familiar with System D? One, two. <laughs> the cool thing is you just drop a System C, D service file in the etc system D directory, and it's super simple. You just say uh, display for X. Uh, and you, you have a, a simple line that says when GPIO um, pin number 7 rises, i.e. goes from 0 to 1, Luther, then just turn, <laughs> just turn on the, uh, the screen. And, it's, and that's it. And then you, you enable it and it starts up and boot. It's super simple to maintain. Um, it's just, that's it. And, and the cool thing, they don't really interfere with, with each other, so you can have multiple... Um, services running on that same rising uh, sort of uh, event. They don't mess around with each other and you can have all the other cool things about uh, Raspberry Pi. It's connected to the internet. The whole tool chain is very clean. You don't have to like, I don't know, this, all these new Kickstarter projects have some weird tool chain that isn't quite free, which freaks me out. But everything here is, is pretty much free, except maybe the OMX stuff, um, which is for decoding MP4s. But yeah, it's it's pretty good. I, I really like it. So what, what's the lag between the you know, turn it off and then what's actually the real lag between between the signal that you actually trigger thing? Oh, um, it's it's I mean it's it's really minute. Like for example, let's do some crazy test. Like I'm gonna make it blank after five seconds now, so the screen should should blank. So right five now, seconds. He just didn't say on, not off. Well, I mean, that's how I said it. I mean, I could, I could do it other way. So, so just imagine that Web Converger, since it's sort of devised for like digital signage. So, if you had the sign say outside hackerspace, you wouldn't want to on in the in the you know morning hours, wasting power. You would only want to on when someone walks in front of the screen. So, you would have the PR pointing out, and as you can see, it should be like fairly instantaneous. It's the, the cool thing, it's an interrupt value. It's, it, it's, a, it's GPIO. Uh, if you can see, hold on, this thing's going to be annoying now. I'm going to change it to uh, six, 60 seconds or something. But as, as you can see here, uh, it blocks here on, the, on this very cool little binary. It blocks on that, uh, like GPIO rising, it blocks there. If it, once it is, goes from 0 to 1, then it runs XZ DPI, DPMS force on. Super duper simple. No Node.js stupid little interpreters. Uh, bash, uh, bash is stupidly fast and very easy wait, to debug. Wait, are you saying that you spawn a new process after the end of after, after, after you get a rising edge drop? Yeah, it's just going to be so much. Yeah, but you're spawning a new. That's, that's a few micros, milliseconds right well, there. That's not fast enough. Well, it doesn't, to be honest, it's not about speed, it's more about simplicity. And that's the beautiful yeah. thing about using a Unix environment. And, and, and systemd actually is pretty nice too it's for managing lots of services. I know. So, yeah, um, that's my talk, I hope. So, yeah, you can use, you're very welcome to use WebConverger as a, as a base for your little projects. And, and you'll have a super up to date system and you can play around with GPIO. Is it on GitHub? GitHub? Yeah. yeah, sure it is. Nice. Sure it is. Where, where can we get the Raspberry Pi built for rest, uh, Web Converger? You just, um, like, this might blow your mind, it might, the internet might not work here. Let's see, uh, GitHub, oh no, you're going to watch me or what is that? Type github.com. No! Oh, you have to compile it? <laughs> no! Cross compile it. No, no, I know that, that's not a plan. Why do you go to GitHub? Yeah. Is it loading? He's trying to show me this.
Yeah, but I, I don't want the GitHub page. I want to compile binary. <laughs> I don't want to compile my own Linux. It's, it's, it's a binary distribution based on Arch Linux. So what I pioneered on with Web Converge, I've done this a few years ago. The whole root FS is actually checked into Git. The whole root FS, okay. so which is freaking it. brilliant. So you have a total integrity of your whole system. So you know, if, if someone's hacked your system, you can just go git status, boom, I know what's changed. Oh, but actually, that's a horrible huh? idea. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It, it works. It, works. it, makes, it makes it very simple. Are you saying that this one is only meant for the Raspberry Pi? Two, yeah. What other other newer modules that are coming out? What do you mean the new one? Like it like is new. What? Old Droid hard kernel. No, uh, well, the, well, there are Arch Linux um, ports for these devices, but to be honest, I can't be bothered. I'm just focusing on Raspberry Pi 2. Yeah, so if we, if we scroll down, the, the setup is a little bit complicated. Well, it's just as complicated as Arch Linux ARM. You, you set up the, the, the fat partition for the Raspberry Pi 2, and the magic happens where you um, you basically add the uh, GitHub repo, and then you just do a git pull. You download the binaries, and you reboot, and you're away. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Everything is absolutely transparent. And every time I make an update, you don't have to read some stupid change log or, or just believe what I've said. You can just go into the commits thing and see exactly what I've done. So you can see if I'm a complete idiot or a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah, I hope you give it a try. It should make your lives easier. Any questions? Do you have a Raspbian port? Raspbian port? What do you mean? The uh, Raspberry Pi. The no, Raspbian. No, I, I, the reason why I chose Arch Arm is it's a simpler distribution and it's lighter weight. Packaging is way simpler and I like the systemd integration. Because, you know, like running, making services, writing services like this uh, that are basically just one line instead of like something with the RCD or whatever it is. This is so much simpler, and you have some really good tools to for logging, checking the status, and debugging. It's really nice to see. So, yeah, and and also, if you want a digital sign, you can use it. Um, I mean, how many of you guys have a screen at work? You can show a web page and show some key metrics about how your company is failing. Or winning, <laughs> and uh, hopefully one cause depression. <laughs> you should definitely consider a vapor merger for that task. Cool. Okay. Does it work on a VPN? No, I'm only doing the ARM7 Raspberry Pi 2 at the moment. If there was demand, if you said, Kai, here's a thousand dollars, do the Odroid C1, I'd say okay, because building building the image <laughs> is not is not so difficult. There's only a few. So well, well, a scam where we have to buy new Raspberry Pi 2s from Luther? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. The reason why I did, I did choose the board code saying Raspberry Pi 2 is I don't know if you've run a, It's not a scam. If you've run a browser on the original Raspberry Pi, it is horrendous. Now, now using, I mean, to be honest, the WebKit, uh, WebKit 2 on, on Raspberry Pi 2 is not great either, but at least you have like one gig of memory. So this is actually the available memory count. So I can tell if there's a memory leak. Um, but yeah, the browser sort of works in the Raspberry Pi 2. This is why I've aimed it for digital signage, so non, non very interactive type usage. Because if you use it as, as if you expect to use it like your, your laptop or something, you're going to be sadly disappointed. So yeah, Raspberry Pi is even worse performance. Raspberry 2, we're getting closer. Maybe the Raspberry 3 will be or something uh, even better. And I will move to Raspberry Pi uh, 3. I mean, building the, the web image images is fairly simple, actually. It's like building like a Docker image in some ways. I played with Haskell on Raspberry Pi. And I must say that as long as you don't compile anything, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I wouldn't do that. Uh, Shell is actually a pretty good language. And yeah, very that, that's a really brief very question. Easy. That... Okay, guys. Let me call it All right, I think, uh, I think that's it. Uh, announcements. Yeah, okay, so guys, before you go, uh, we have some announcements. We have been approached by IDA. So we are um, Hackerspace, part of uh, Next Saturday. 
So they are calling for projects uh, to be displayed on Hackerspace both. So if you guys are interested, please approach uh, me or Luther. Where am I? I'm sorry. It's uh, on 25th of April. Uh, it's at Suntech, I believe. Yeah, so if you want more details. What, what, what is Tech Saturday? Tech Saturday, well, basically it's uh, the government's initiative of the Smart Nation, so they want to introduce the public to technologies and stuff. So, yeah. I'm going to forget what you said just now, tomorrow. Yep. Where can I find information? I'll, I'll post it on Hackware, so yeah, you can apply in the thread also. Uh, Kai will be there, so if you want to spend the whole Saturday with him. What? <laughs> <laughs> I told you not to say that. Oh, shit. <laughs> There won't be any room at all in Hackspace. Uh, okay, and then uh, the day right after that, 26, there's going to be Hackware Labs. So, since you guys are like itching to uh, play with Kai's toys or whatever, uh, I think, uh, Shinmei, can you ex uh, Yeah, you want to elaborate on what will happen on 26? Fernvale. 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 Yes, yes, yes. There, there will be a workshop. So, basically, uh, during the post session, we uh, talked with Bunny and Xops, and they were so nice as to tell at, le at least Xops will be there for sure, and Bunny maybe if uh, his customers will not need him at the same very moment. And they will give us tutorial uh, about how to uh, upload our own apps to the Fernweb platform. Uh, to those that do not yet know, it's this. Twelve dollar phone, which is basically a single chip package that has Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GSM, second generation, and many other features. Twelve dollars. Yes, I mean twelve dollars is the whole package. The chip you can buy for probably like four or five dollars. I've just bought the the, the watch, smart watch with display and everything that cost like thirty. It's the same as Apple. Exactly. This is a lot of resolution different. maybe is like the I think the yellow color the is different. The point though. is that <laughs> the yellow so color is the price different. of twelve dollars you get something as capable as Raspberry Pi, maybe it's slightly smaller than Raspberry yeah. second generation. But so who's behind Fernware? Fernware? Who's behind that? Uh, this is Xop and Bunny. Oh. Xop and Bunny. Oh. Yeah. So Bunny Bong is a well known hardware hacker, yeah. uh, lives in Singapore. Uh, and he'll be doing the workshop. Well, uh, his partner in crime is also be doing it for sure. And Bunny might be coming down here. Where is it? Hackerspace, right? It will in be Hackerspace. Hackerspace. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just register on meetup.com. Yeah. Uh, event so we know how many kits to have. Because they're la I'm, I'm guessing Bunny and Zops will be bringing along kits to lend out yes. during the to, to, for you to play with. And the, they'll take it back. The I'm, background I'm of the whole thing is that they found a twelve dollar phone in yeah. Shenzhen. Yeah. Yeah. And they took it to pieces and then they said, Well actually this is a really cool chip in here yeah. and they x rayed it and then That's they just completely one open sourced everything. Well they're even, trying to at least. Even well, though the documents are all kind of confidential, they reverse engineered all you know, many of the things yeah. like the hardware lines and how to do this. They've written their own bootloader well, and or uh, if you guys, um, so Hackware Labs is uh, a monthly thing also, so this is the talks and that's the hands on thing. If you guys want to take part in that, you can actually just bring down your stuff and also do your hacking at the same time. So, yeah, be a lot of activities uh, going on. Okay. Uh, and actually, is it June? July, I think. In, Ju in July June or July. Actually, so, uh, similar to Tech Saturday, there's also Maker Fair going. Uh, happening so, uh, Science Center also approached us and say if you guys want to showcase our projects, please. Uh, so get your projects prepared by then. So if you can't make it for the Tech Saturday to showcase, so we still have like a couple of months to work on it. So, they have. Yeah. Oh, we'll do this. Yeah. Okay. If they want uh, proposals in. Yeah, yeah, just, well, we'll do some hackerspace awesomeness. Just, just, tell, just tell us that uh, <laughs> you, if you guys are interested, uh, you don't need to show us your project. Okay. Alright. Uh, Speaker for the next, next uh, hackware. Yeah, if you guys have something to share for the next hackware, which will be on the second Wednesday of May. Yep. Like drones or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> location still not confirmed yet. Uh, we will, we'll Backup location, hackerspace. Yes. Yeah, so we started at Hackerspace, that's our backup location. Uh, but if you can find somewhere more awesome, like uh, with free drinks and uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyone else who wants, wants to sponsor, absolutely awesome. please approach us. A bunch of most awesome hardware hackers in Singapore. Yep, cool. So, uh, anything else? Anything else, anyone else? Anyone?
Oh yeah, thank you, PayPal. Thank you, PayPal. Yeah, thank thank you, PayPal. PayPal. What time do we have to leave? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Alright, get out of the tents, people. <laughs> <laughs> <See ya. laughs> Alright, thank you very much. See you guys next. Thank you.